Salut, this is Elena from Elena the Expat and today I'm in Chisinau, but instead of showing you the beauties of the city, I want to dive deeper into the life of expats here in Moldova. Why did they choose this destination, whether they generally like or dislike life in Moldova, and finally, how successful were they at opening businesses here? Our today's hero is David, he's a small business owner and he regularly writes about politics and economy here in Moldova. Without further ado, let's meet him. Hi David, very nice to meet you. So you've been in Moldova for over a decade. Please let me know and all the listeners, like how did you come to Moldova in the first place? Actually, it's coming up on 12 years. So in June, wow. it'll be 12 years. I came to Moldova in June uh, 2012 as a Peace Corps volunteer. So um, for those who don't know the Peace Corps, it's an American government volunteering program. Uh, volunteers come from the U.S. to serve in a country at the country's request. Moldova had a couple different programs at the time. I was in one called Community and uh, well, Community Development, Youth Development. I started with a children's center there and then wound up working a bit with the University of Lake Rousseau on more business development questions and then later with the City Hall on a city youth program. Why did you decide of all the countries that you could go as a Peace Corps volunteer mm -hmm. to come to Moldova? So Peace Corps is kind of funny. You don't really decide. You get a little bit of preference put in, but part of the whole idea is that you, or at least at the time, it's changed a little, you are willing to go wherever. So I was actually sent to Kazakhstan. Oh. So I spent nine months in Kazakhstan in 2011. There I was an English teacher, but we ended our time in Kazakhstan, Peace Corps evacuated. And then after that, Peace Corps gave me the opportunity to pick where I would go. Mm. So I did get to pick Moldova. And part of it was I had been learning Russian in Kazakhstan. So I got a couple of options of countries and Moldova was a great continuation. So that's hence living in belts for two years, more of a Russian speaking part of the country. From what I know, usually the Peace Corps volunteers, they leave the country or go to another country or return back to the US after the term finishes. Why did you decide to stay? A lot of people kind of use Peace Corps as a career change. So either they're young coming out of college, they do Peace Corps and they figure out what's next, or they're older and they want to take a break and reevaluate. I kind of did like a huge career change because <laughs> uh, before Peace Corps, I had gotten a degree in electrical engineering. Mm. My focus is on actually satellite engineering and communication. So when I wound up here, I worked with small business development, with uh, youth development, with local government. And I decided to stay with a couple friends and open a restaurant. So very different. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. totally unexpected. Did you always know that you wanted to open a business or you just saw an opportunity here in Moldova? When I was a volunteer, I did a certain amount of time working with small business development. So this is usually young people, you know, a little after college, really about the age I was at the time, who had ideas for starting a business. They, in many cases, had good ideas. They're very passionate, but none of them did. And the reason everybody came back to time and again was corruption. Oh. I said, there's too much corruption, there are too many problems, this is not the place to do it. And most of the people I knew through that context wound up leaving the country. So about six months before I left the Peace Corps, my friend Matt and I, who's another American volunteer, we were discussing this and we realized that like, we had heard this story time and again. So an idea started and we decided we were going to stay in Moldova. We met our friend Vlad, so he's from Chisinau, so the three of us were going to start a company. We saw an opportunity for an American-style barbecue restaurant with craft beer. And there was actually no craft beer in Moldova at the time, but we wanted to um, support local, locally owned smaller businesses, smaller breweries. And then around the same time we opened, Litra Brewing Company opens the first craft brewery. So we opened in 2015, in July and uh, built an American barbecue and craft beer place. How do you remember Moldova being, you know, in 2011-12 when you came here versus now, like almost in a span of a decade, more than a span of a decade? No, I mean, I see tons of changes, tons. Um, I'll start with the easy ones. Okay. Since I've been here, I think Moldova's grown an incredible food space. I mean, mm -hmm. so many good restaurants, so many good I mean, everything from good craft beer to craft cocktails, the wine scene is so much better. Like, 
you know, Moldova was known for wine, but there were almost no good wine bars at the time. I just won when we opened uh, Carpe Diem was working. 2012, restaurants were just starting to get names. Mm -hmm. So before that, it was kind of like, oh, you know the restaurant at the corner of these two streets? Yeah, didn't really have a name. We just knew where it was. I mean, we've always had a couple big ones that people knew, but for most of them, it was really simple. At the time, I remember, you know, the roads were pretty rough. <laughs> they were very rough. Uh, sidewalks, every time I went to Chisinau, I'd bring a change of pants because I'd walk on the sidewalk and if it rained, the mud would get all over you. And now you can walk around Chisinau, it feels like a European city. And it didn't quite before. You know, you've seen this cultural change and trends change. At that time, everybody talked about corruption, like, you know, oh, this is really bad. Now it's something we talk about every day, in a good way. And as in a, it's a problem that needs to be solved and managed. And we've seen this big shift in the way, I, I want to say Moldovans talk about the problems that everybody knew were there, but weren't trying to fix or weren't mm -hmm. really talking about trying to fix. And there's uh, been this kind of civic birth too that's really been cool to see and to play a small part in. You've been a business owner for 10 years, and I know that now you have sold your business to another company. Can you tell us more about what's the process of opening a company, of opening a restaurant, how complicated <laughs> it is? So in 2014, we registered our company. Moldova was very proud uh, at the time that it was really quick and easy to register a company. Mm. And it was, it took two days or something. But the legal time between you could open your company, get your stamp, and actually open a restaurant, was a minimum of 72 days. And that assumes you already have the location, the rental contract, and you're done with the construction. So you needed the health department to check you out, the fire department, all these different things, which is, you know, okay, that's normal. The problem was at the time, you could only do them in a line. You couldn't do two things at the same time. For example, we needed a certificate that said, our restaurant doesn't kill animals. <laughs> We might serve meat, but we go buy it from Metro. We don't actually kill a cow. But to get that certificate, all you need to do is go to an office. You say, I need the certificate that says we don't kill animals. That office takes it out. You sign it, and then they have to sign it and give it to you. But legally, they have 30 days before they must answer you. Oh. So they just put it in a pile at the corner of their desk, and they say, well, you know, if you want it now, maybe we could go have a smoke and we could make a deal. Otherwise, come back in 30 days. The problem then is, <laughs> until you have that certificate, you can't go to the health department. You can't go to whatever. So it was a long, bureaucratic and, and quite corrupt process. Uh, but we did manage it and we managed to open. So we, we opened in uh, 2015, in July. Within about a year, we had realized there were a lot of problems. There were more problems than we could deal with ourselves. And so we uh, co-founded, I co-founded on behalf of our restaurant, a small business association. And our association was the first one to represent um, all sectors of small business. We started with a few members but grew and the goal was to kind of address these problems of bureaucracy, corruption, things like that, and try to advocate for change. And one of the first things we got to participate in was advising on a USAID project that was actually looking at this problem, how quick it is to open a restaurant. And in the course of that, the reforms that they, they, their lawyers worked on and then the government passed, that time frame went from 72 days to 15. So That's a huge improvement. Huge difference, but it's, it's different not just because of the time. I needed to go as a business owner to each and every office and then talk to them, get a certification, get something. And you go into their office and you're in their power central, you know. The new reform, the new version that's in effect now, is you just notify one office, say I'm opening a restaurant, and then they have 15 days to come to check you. Mm -hmm. And if they come to check you, they can make requ like requests, they can ask you to change something. Unless you've done something really horrible, they can't tell you not to open, but they can tell you some stuff to change or give you advice, uh, and then you open in 15 days. We opened our second restaurant in, I wanna say 2017, and the process was much easier. Uh, faster, we had no real problems of corruption at that time. So things are getting better, mm -hmm. for sure. 
but how much time did it take you to um, you know, uh, rent the location, look at the location, mm -hmm. renovate it, hire workers, uh, buy all the equipment because you had to cook there. Of course. Can you tell me more about this? From the registering of the company to the day we opened our doors, it being a year. A big part of that delay, uh, probably six months of that delay, was actually another um, problem of corruption. Uh, we had, my business partner Matt and I had applied to get our work permits and um, we were rejected and the Bureau of Immigration and Migration wanted a, a big bribe at the time <laughs> and we had to fight with that. Um, we didn't pay any bribes but it took us a long time. So putting all the bureaucracy aside to actually opening the restaurant, it probably took us six months. We did it, uh, I'd say, the hard way. I did most of the work remodeling uh, the restaurant myself, mm. so the carpentry, the woodwork, uh, table, chair design, this kind of stuff. My business partner Matt designed the kitchen and worked with, you know, there are great local companies that do manufacturing for Enox and stainless steel, so we had the custom stuff built. Uh, but it, it, it takes time, I mean it, it really takes time and it, it takes more time if you're a first time business or restaurant owner like we were. Um, you know, we've since opened other businesses and things are much faster because you kind of know what you're doing a lot right. more. It was not very difficult for us to find people. We, we found, we had a lot of job applications. We had some people who were really qualified. Um, we were trying to open something new. I mean, it was an American restaurant, American service standard. So we did a lot of training with our team about how they, they should work with customers, how they should know mm -hmm. the products. The experience right now is a lot harder. The number one problem companies talk about in Moldova right now is finding people. And that's for every level of job, um, high experience, low experience, entry level, doesn't matter. People are having a lot of trouble. And um, this is part of much bigger political and economic you know, questions, but it's mostly Moldova's outbound migration. It's people leaving the country. Uh, it's especially bad since the war started. Um, a lot of people have left. I know that you went through a very difficult patch with the restaurant going through COVID. I think everybody, all the restaurants and hotels and so many other businesses in the world uh, felt this uh, huge issue. And uh, I know that it really affected your business in a negative way. Can you tell us a little bit about that time and how you handled business? Ooh, uh, yeah, that was no Sorry fun. Sorry to remind you. No, it was no fun. I. Uh... <laughs> Sometimes I don't like thinking about it, but I guess, you know, we have to think back. And I remember so distinctly when it started. There was a Tuesday and uh, it was the last normal day. The restaurant did a trivia night. House was full, people were having fun. Wednesday, business was down 25%. Thursday, another 25. Friday, another 25. Saturday, my team called me. I was at home and they're like, we have no customers. Absolutely no one's here. So we closed the restaurant. We figured we'd close, assuming there would be lockdowns. The lockdown started Monday, so we closed a little earlier even, but, uh, but it didn't matter. People had self-locked down already. Um, that early period was really, really hard. I mean, it was really hard. Um, we did some delivery business, a little, uh, but there's really only so much you can do with that. Obviously, we struggled. Um, we took in some credits and different things to survive, but eventually, in, what was it, by December 2021, we realized we, we had to do something to try to save the business, so we shut down Smokehouse, our first restaurant. Um, we had another one, so actually they were right next to each other, so we had Smokehouse and Tap Room. We decided to keep the smaller one, migrate the kitchen over, remodel it a little, but try to operate a little bit smaller to just get to that, you know, three months, six months, you know. But of course that turns, you know, Omicron or Delta, different things. And then when things finally did start to end COVID-wise, the war started. U ultimately, we sold Tap Room, our last of the restaurants, in August. And it was going out of business basically due to COVID. I mean, business came back in Moldova. It, it came back. People are out and about right now. It's probably no better time to go out and enjoy a restaurant in Chisinau than now. But it was too late, too long, too much damage. David, let's talk money and investment mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people want to open a business, uh, but I want to know a little bit more about the realities and the uh, cash that you need to have in order to open a business. When we were opening Smokehouse, we, our building was about 
290 square meters. We had seats for, I think, 95 people. This is a decent size yeah, sit down big, restaurant. Big restaurant. We were really bootstrapped. We had a low budget. We had a small amount of our own money. We had a couple investors. We had money for basic kitchen equipment, mm -hmm. basic. And we had money for mm, kind of wood to build a bar, furniture, and some simple lights. Mm. But most of the lights I made out of glass jars. We had no money for a designer. We had no money for a kitchen uh, consultant or planner. We had no money for hiring early on management who would do these processes for us. So we found a building that already had been a restaurant. I mean, it needed a lot of work but it was mostly cosmetic work. Um, big costs that you really don't want to take on yourself are like ventilation up to the roof, dealing with changing the walls, the electric, uh, installing utilities. In you know, some countries, you might be able to make a deal with your landlord around some of these costs. In Moldova, you can with some, but the reality here is that most things you do are going to be your cost. You come into work one day and water is coming through the roof because a pipe exploded upstairs. That's never your landlord's problem. That's your problem, that's your money. <laughs> so you've got to um, look to infrastructure because that's going to be a big investment. I've known friends and companies who have opened a restaurant for under $50,000. I don't know if that's possible anymore. And I know a lot who spend 300,000, 400,000, you know. Are we talking so. nowadays here in Moldova? Yeah, in Moldova. So is it a restaurant comparable to the size of what you had, like 90 yeah. seats? Yeah, yeah. First one I said, I, I said even 50,000. You could do kind of a bar with that, with a very limited kitchen. Or you used to be able to. Now, probably not. Um, I mean, I would say now you, you probably have a minimum of 100,000. Mm. But, but who knows? Like, it depends on how you build it. Right. What kind of food are you going to have? What, what are you going to serve? What's your kitchen look like? It's just all these things are totally different. But um, one of the biggest costs that you have to consider, um, it goes back to me saying you got to be really involved. So one thing a lot of restaurant owners do if they just don't want to think about it is they hire a big kitchen company to design their kitchen and sell the equipment. So there are two really big companies that do this in Moldova. They're very, very expensive. So if I do that, I don't have to think about my kitchen at all. It'll just be delivered to me. But I'm going to spend eight or 9,000 euros for an oven. And I could go to a competitor, same in Chisinau, and spend 1,000, 1,500 euros for the mm -hmm. same oven. So you get simplicity on one hand, but you pay four or five times more. So it's willingness to, to work, to shop around, to go find something good here, something good there, and piece it together. I know? feel like restaurant business is one of those businesses where a lot of people, especially coming into Moldova, have this fantasy about you know, not knowing a lot about how to run a business, but just coming here and miraculously you know, opening a restaurant. Yeah. But there are a lot of details, like you said, like you have to figure out how to find a good oven, that you have to invest time yeah. uh, and resources to, to do this work. None of us had restaurant experience except my partner Matt who had worked at Taco Bell for two weeks. Ah. So like, that's like no experience, right? So uh, restaurants are often passion projects. They, they can be kind of your dream, you know, something people really wanted to do. Um, but at the same time, you have to realize that they are a business. And you know, the typical thing, they say write a budget, get as deep into it as you can, give a price for every piece of equipment that you know how to do and then multiply it by two, because you're gonna be wrong, <laughs> like by a lot. Um, that kind of thing, you know, you have to have some financial planning, you have to have preparation, uh, but, but I don't wanna discourage anybody from doing that. I mean, if you've got a plan and a passion for something, hard work shouldn't discourage you, you know? It's just the reality that like, you gotta contend with it. Yeah. It's not a part-time job, you know? A lot of people come to Moldova and they want to open a business but they are new to the country and they don't really know what sort of resources do they have. Mm -hmm. Can you recommend any blogs, associations, clubs that people can join to maybe discuss their business plans, getting some help of opening a company, anything like that? I uh, suggest people look for the Moldova Small Enterprise Alliance or AIM. We're in a 
association of small businesses. We have about 120 members right now from all different sectors, from restaurants to IT to auto manufacturing. How can somebody <laughs> Pretty much join? anything. So just find our website, sme.md. We'll leave the there's, contacts in the description. Cool. Yeah, there's information there. We, we also created a product uh, that I was the lead author on a few years ago called the Moldova Small Business Handbook. So it's a couple years old, but it walks you through starting a company, have business planning tips, what you should know about taxes and things like that. That's on the website in English, Russian, and Romanian. Additionally, I'd say there is a government resource here. It's now called Invest Moldova. I would say historically this has not been very helpful uh, unless you're a really big company, but they're reforming it right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that their team has a lot of ambition and Moldova is trying to attract investment now and really trying to be a supportive place um, for entrepreneurs. And we'll kind of see how that goes, but I'd encourage people to try it out. I think it's Invest MD, but we'll put a link. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Are there any regular or irregular meetings where people can just network um, in this small business environment? Yeah, so our association, we're uh, first and foremost, I mean, an association of companies. We're a community. Uh, we call ourselves a community of optimistic entrepreneurs. And you, you've got to be optimistic to yeah. be an entrepreneur anywhere, but uh, definitely in Moldova as well. So yeah, we have regular meetups uh, for members. Join once a month, usually do a business over drinks, networking. We have speakers. Um, we're gonna have a big conference coming up in the spring. We'll bring speakers actually from different countries in Europe to talk about trends in business and things like that. In anticipation of the conference, since we're having this interview, I just wanna get a snippet and um, ask you, what do you think are the main trends and directions for opening a business now in Moldova? Like, is it a restaurant business? Is it an IT business? Is it something else? Moldova is going through a tough time economically. We've got inflation way down from where it had been, but there's been a crisis in pretty much every sector for a little while. Um, looking ahead, I mean, Moldova has an evolving restaurant sector and hospitality. I think the biggest growth trend there in the next few years will be in um, rural tourism and tourism, well, inbound tourism. So for people coming from outside Moldova, visiting. Traditionally, that's been really small. Mm -hmm. There are so few tourists that come to Moldova every year. It's getting bigger as a lot more people know where the country is. And as a lot of the infrastructure for rural tourism and guest houses and experiences have been built up, uh, which is weirdly a byproduct of COVID. When Moldovans couldn't travel abroad, they traveled mm -hmm. within the country and there came to be like all these new businesses around that, which are now going to help serve people from outside too. Also something people should think about a lot is, uh, is the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in terms of a security threat. Uh, Moldova is quite safe, um, but Ukraine will rebuild at some point. Moldova is changing its entire infrastructure as it moves towards the EU and it's integrating much more closely with Romania and Ukraine. And I know that in terms of um, infrastructure projects, energy projects, construction, things like this, there are gonna be really big opportunities here. <laughs> there, there are gonna be big changes in the marketplace and, and you know, with change comes opportunity. And that comes from both the EU, but also just Moldova's changing place in the world. I used to kind of joke, Moldova is a small country on the way to nowhere. You don't have to go through Moldova to get to anywhere. <laughs> That's changed a lot. You know, we're now part of a critical tie-in between Ukraine and Europe. And uh, that's gonna bring a lot of shifts, a lot of shifts from more people coming to, to again, you know, infrastructure connections that will change stuff. And finally, one thing we'll be addressing a lot in the conference uh, our association's holding is uh, AI. And I don't mean that like Moldova's got a lot of potential to become a big place where AI is created, but it's that that's going to be the trend we're watching most for all companies and industries, that integrating different AI products is going to change almost every type of industry in the next year or years to come. So we're focused on talking to our members about that and trying to bring speakers from other countries to really focus on it. So.